Hitler races away from the wedding. He goes back to his hotel. He says, put the army on alert. We're going to move. He says to Goering, who's also at the wedding, presumably been stuffing himself with sausages. He says to Goering, go back to Berlin. Prepare to deal with the Conservatives. I will handle the stormtroopers in Munich. You deal with the Conservatives in Berlin. The Night of the Long Knives, Tom, is about to get started. Hitler had entered Röhm's bedroom alone with a whip in his hand. Behind him had stood two detectives holding pistols with the safety catch removed at the ready. He had spat out the words, Röhm, you are under arrest! Röhm had looked up sleepily out of the pillows on his bed. Hail, mein Führer! You are under arrest! Hitler had bawled for the second time. He had turned on his heel and left the room. Meanwhile, upstairs in the corridor, things have become very lively. SA leaders are coming out of their rooms and being arrested. Hitler shouts at each one. Have you had anything to do with Röhm's machinations? Of course. None of them says yet, but that doesn't help them. Hitler mostly knows the answer himself. Now and then he turns to Goebbels or Lutzer with question, and then comes his decision. Arrested! So that was Eric Kemper, who was the driver of Adolf Hitler, who was describing the morning of the 30th of June, 1934, that sees um, a bloody and carnivorous faction fight in the Nazi party, uh, a faction fight that is commemorated as the Night of the Long Knives. Um, and Dominic, this is the first kind of the great drama, really, of the Nazis in power, isn't it? And we did, uh, this time last year, four episodes on the rise of the Nazis to power. And now we're going to do six episodes looking at the Nazis in power. Yes. Um, that was a slightly Inspector Clouseau-ish Hitler, I thought, there, uh, Tom. No, he was German. He was clearly indisputably German. Well, of course, Hitler had an Austrian accent. I don't know whether you were trying to give an Austrian yeah, flavour there. Yeah. Were you? Were you? Yes. Of course you were. Um, so so for those people who um, haven't listened to our series on the rise of the Nazis, um, please do. Um, for those of you uh, who haven't got time to do it and just want to crack on with the Night of the Long Knives, which, as Tom says rightly, is this seismic moment in the early years of the Third Reich. I, th I guess we'll just give a little bit of a recap of where we got to um, with the Nazis and their rise to power. So as we explored last time, the roots of Nazism lie in the 1880s and 1890s in this kind of ferment of ideas, kind of social Darwinism, obsession with racial hygiene, um, obsession with national degeneracy, war with struggle, with, and with anti-Semitism in particular. Those ideas were very current in Germany before the First World War. Um, there are equivalents elsewhere, of course, with a slightly different flavour. Um, but then they became intensified, I suppose, turbocharged, would you say, Tom, by the Great War and the experience of the war, the shattering experience for Germany. Because they lose. And that's the key. And the fact that uh, so many people are starving in Germany and then they lose. Absolutely. They lose. Germany loses a lot of territory. There is the German Revolution in 1918, 1919. Total chaos on the streets. The Kaiser is kicked out. Fears of Bolshevism. And in this atmosphere, lots of little... Uh, paramilitary parties and things uh, flourish. One of them is the um, German Workers' Party, the National Socialist Party, as it becomes. And this attracts a former corporal in the Bavarian army who had previously been born in Austria, who is Adolf Hitler, who discovers that he has this brilliant gift of the gab, that he's able to articulate all the rage and resentment of former servicemen who feel betrayed by the end of the war. And in particular, his guiding principle is anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism that he had learned as a young man in Vienna um, before the First World War. And he now develops this entire worldview based on war and struggle and racism and in particular anti-Semitism. And the Nazis tried a failed putsch in 1923. Um, obviously it didn't work out. Uh, Hitler was briefly imprisoned. Um, but they profit from a couple of things. You know, they, in other circumstances, they would have remained an extreme, eccentric, radical party. But they profit from the fact that the new republic that's been set up in Germany in the 1920s, the Weimar Republic, uh, lacks legitimacy from the start in the eyes of a lot of conservative Germans. That so many conservative Germans and middle class Germans and whatnot are terrified of communism, of Bolshevism and disorder. They, they don't believe... It's not just that they don't believe the Weimar Republic will be a bulwark against it. They actually think the Weimar Republic is, is riddled with it and that anything left of centre is kind of crypto-communist. 
And then the, the absolute searing impact of the Great Depression, which is worse in Germany than almost anywhere else in the world. Massive unemployment. And against that background, the Nazis prosper as a kind of populist party. And then the terrible mistake that conservative elites employ Hitler effectively. You know, they've run out of options. They're feuding with each other. They bring Hitler in as the hired gun, don't they, Tom? Um, they do. And they appoint him chancellor at the end of January 1933. And Dominic, just to name check some of those conservatives, because they will be playing a part in this drama. We have the Reich president, who is an enormous bloke with a kind of walrus moustache, uh, called Hindenburg, who was a great war hero. Paul von Hindenburg. Yeah, war hero, exactly. So he is very elderly. He's about 183 he at this point. Yeah. And perhaps not entirely compostmentous. Then we have um, a, an effete Machiavel. He's described by, as by Michael Burley. Um, von Papen, uh, who you described as looking like a Daily Telegraph leader writer. That's right. So they're kind of operating behind the scenes. Um, and also, um, before Hitler... There is a, a general, Schleicher, Trotsky. So let's get a description from Trotsky. He described Schleicher as a, a question mark with epaulettes, which I think is a great description. And he's kind of, um, he embodies an ambition, perhaps on the part of, of, of generals, for a military dictatorship. Yes. And so is there a sense that the army as well are players in this? Absolutely. That they would quite fancy to be running the show? Absolutely. The, the most plausible alternative to a Nazi regime in 1933 is a right-wing nationalist army-run military dictatorship or something like that, maybe an alliance between the conservative business elites and the army. And they, there is a tension there right from the beginning in the Nazi regime. Um, but to just uh, finish up the recap, so in the very last episode of our Rise of the Nazis series, we described how as soon as Hitler becomes chancellor, he unleashes this wave of violence on the streets through his stormtroopers. We'll come to the stormtroopers in a little bit, who is paramilitary kind of militia. Events play massively into his hands. An anarchist burns down the Reichstag, a Dutch anarchist, and which is the parliament building. Hitler uses this as an opportunity to push through an emergency decree that allows him to suspend civil liberties. He wins an election and then he intimidates uh, the Reichstag, the parliament, into passing an enabling act that means he can basically rule by decree outside the constitution without the Reichstag having any say in the matter. And that is then followed by a huge purge of institutions and a kind of Nazification of German life with everything from universities, I mean, a university is actually leading the charge, students burning books and so on, to things like rifle clubs and hobbyist groups becoming Nazified. So already by the summer of 1933, you are well on the way to the formation of a totalitarian state. And um, the communists have been banned. The other parties have kind of purged themselves, have, have voted themselves into liquidation concentration camps have been opened the rule of law is imploding so all in all it's looking like springtime for hitler and germany <laughs> very you might good say to coin very phrase. good Tom. very good yeah exactly to sort of um start to dig deeper into the story so by the summer of 1933 for a lot of ordinary germans if you're not a communist or a, so or a keen social democrat or homosexual or you know a, a, jew. a jew exactly above all a jew you may well think that actually this has worked out all right there is a sense that you have finally a stable government, a sense of energy and activity that is coming from Berlin. So from that perspective, you know, Hitler has won his ele he's got his enabling act. He's done well in the elections. You know, things are looking good. The problem for him is that there are massive tensions, as you've alluded to, within the Nazi regime from the very beginning. Um, so on the one hand, there's a lot of people who think the Nazis should be a radical movement that they should utterly change German society, sweep away the old order and create a new Germany and, and kind of new men and women um, to live in it. These are, this is the kind of, it sounds a diabolical thing to say, but them almost the sort of idealistic side of Nazism. And then the other side of the coin is that this kind of national conservative old elite, the army and so on, who think, well, we're basically running the show and we don't like all this sort of disorder and stuff. Because, Dominic, the cabinet... Although Hitler's chancellor, there are very few kind of Nazis in it, aren't there? Most of them are still people in wing collars and yeah. all that kind of stuff. If you see Hitler with his cabinet, I was watching um, a documentary last night. If you see Hitler and his cabinet walking th through the streets in January 1933 or February 1933, there are a whole, a whole load of men in top hats. 
you know, who look like kind of Wall Street bankers or something. And there are times when Hitler appears wearing top hats, aren't there? And Absolutely. Then the next, and then the next day he'll be wearing his brown shirt. So he's kind of playing, he's riding both horses. So this riding the, the both horses is, is proving increasingly difficult for Hitler. And you mentioned the brown shirts. So the brown shirts... The, the SA, the SA, the Sturmabteilung, as they're called, they become an increasing problem for Hitler as 1933 goes on. So what are they? They had begun, as bizarrely, the gym and sports section of the Nazi party. This was a kind of euphemism describing his squad of bouncers that he used at his meetings in the 1920s. And they end up with a much better name. They end up being called the Storm Section, which sounds much more glamorous and exciting. It's very good for attracting young men who like action and want to kind of punch up. The Darling Storms, as Unity Mitford called them. I knew this was going to come up. <laughs> Unity Mitford's a great fan, isn't she? So uh, sort of posh um, aristocrats who we did a podcast about who became infatuated with Hitler and the, and the Stormtroopers. The Stormtroopers are the creation of a guy called Ernst Ruhm, who you mentioned right at the beginning. Ruhm is, he's a, he's, he looks like such a bruiser, doesn't he? If you see photographs of him, he looks like a man who would be standing outside a nightclub with a shaven head. Except in his last year where he looks like Uncle Monty from Withnell and I, which will mean nothing to you because I know you haven't seen it. But he... I know, Richard, Richard Griffiths. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Well, anyway. Uh, I so... mean, I think it's fair to say he puts on weight by the end of... He definitely you know, does. The, the He's muscle a man of turns size. to a bit of flab. So the room... Uh, is a veteran. He's he's from Munich. He's the son of a railway official. He is a veteran of the First World War. Like so many young men, he'd gone to the Western Front with great enthusiasm. A shell had blown part of his nose off. He'd been badly injured at Verdun. Um, he had then joined the Fry Corps, these kind of paramilitary units in the chaos of the 1920s. And then he'd been attracted to the Nazi party. And Ruhm is absolutely typical of these people who are called the Front Generation, they absolutely romanticise and glamorise the experience of the trenches and the camaraderie. Of course, that Hitler, right? Absolutely. But he, he is even more enthusiastic about violence and street fighting than Hitler. As, as far as Roman is concerned, I think street fighting is Nazism. And everything else, like the politics and discussing policy, he thinks that is boring, a waste of time, and actually a compromise with the old order. He loves cracking heads and having big fights. Because we should we should say that the Nazis come to power adopting a, a, a double approach. One, politically, they play the democratic games incredibly well. I mean, Hitler blazes all kinds of innovations that subsequent democratic leaders will follow. But also seizing control of the streets. Yes. And they're mainly fighting communists. But the establishment of, of Nazi rule means that the Nazis have irrevocably seize control of the streets as well as of the democratic institutions. It's exactly as you say, Tom. There's a weird paradox at the heart of the Nazi regime in 1933. On the one hand, they're clearly fermenting disorder on the streets. The stormtroopers are running amok, you know, beating people up, smashing kind of Jewish shop windows, beating Jews up, you know, be strutting around real bully boy kind of behaviour. So they're responsible for disorder. On the other hand, Hitler's promise to the German people is... I'm going to end disorder. I'm the person who will make Germany great again and get everything calmed down. And so he's, he's absolutely riding two horses. Now, there's been a long-running tension between the SA and the rest of the Nazi party because the SA, throughout the 1920s, had become more and more a kind of party within a party. Rome had been in and out. So at one point, he'd actually gone off to run the... Um, Bol the Bolivia, the, didn't he? The, the Bolivian <laughs> yeah. army, which is a very so, bizarre career move. Not not the last Nazi to go to South America. To to, yeah, exactly. Very good. There'd been a bit of a crisis in the SA, which we don't need to go into. They'd fallen out with some of the rest of the Nazi party. And Hitler had brought Röhm back. Now, Röhm was never... He's a, he's a strutting bully boy sort of man. He's kind of Mussolini-esque. Yes, I guess so. Without Mussolini's brains, actually, because Mussolini yeah. was a journalist. Röhm but, but doesn't have any of that physically imposing and presumably hitler has brought rome back because he think he needs his street fighting yes exactly even though he knows that rome is not happy about pursuing kind of political means that rome just wants to have endless fights Get out there and have a crack at the commies exactly the the, the, the shadow that hangs over rome is that he is very flagrantly gay everybody knows this lots of hitler's sort of cronies say to him Oh, the room is a terrible man, kind of carrying on with blonde haired youths, all this stuff. This is not what a, you know, a Nazi should do. 
And actually, Hitler gives him a bit of a pass on it because he needs Rome and he knows that he needs, you know, he has the loyalty of all these stormtroopers. So, so there is a slightly odd and unexpected twist. It's a bit like Mrs. Thatcher, very, very tolerant of her minister's foibles. Right. That's a, that's a comparison that I would expect from, from, um, well, from a lot of Twitter academics, but not necessarily from you. Uh, there you go. Woke the old Hitler Thatcher comparison again, I see. You can take the, the child out of the 1980s, but you can't take the 1980s out of the child, right? Right. So let's fast forward to the summer of 1933. The SA, the Storm Abteilung, the Stormtroopers, have now swollen to an enormous size. Loads of people have poured into their ranks. So they now have four and a half million people who are kind of paid up brown shirt wearing stormtroopers. So they've absorbed lots of other paramilitary groups and veterans groups. I said, Dominic, that must be larger than the, the army. Far larger. Because, of course, the army is hidebound by the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. So the, the army is a shadow of its former self. And the army are very anxious about this. There's this huge paramilitary formation kind of roaming around the streets. Hitler knows that the army commanders are very, very displeased about the existence of the SA. But there's an urgency to this now because Paul von Hindenburg, who has the absolute loyalty of the army. I mean, he is the army's great hero. And he's the president. So the walrus. The walrus, who looks yeah. like he's made of oak or something. He's like the personification of Prussian rigor. He, as you said, is he's actually, I think, about 85. But as you said, he appears to be 270. And he is clearly not long for this world. And when he dies, which is going to be in the next year or two, the army may well insist that one of their people becomes head of state. And that will be a problem for Hitler. It could be a rival power focus. It could be somebody who could act against him and undermine his regime. And so as the SA, the stormtroopers, are kind of running amok and causing all this trouble and actually turning the army against them, that makes Hitler very nervous because Hitler knows he cannot afford to alienate the army commanders. What is worse is that Ruhm, you know, uh, what did you call him, Uncle Monty, mm. crossed with a Serbian Scarface. skirt. Because he's scarred, isn't he? He's, got his, yeah. lost all his he's nose lost his everything. nose. Yeah, yeah, so a noseless Uncle Monty. Yeah, crossed between Voldemort, Tom. And, yes. uh, um, <laughs> and Uncle Monty, yes. He is now saying, well, actually, Nazism has lost its, it's lost its figure. It's lost its imp radical impetus. We need a second revolution, a revolution within the revolution. He says the German revolution has fallen asleep. This is all in the summer of 1933. And there's this argument, are we going to have a permanent revolution? Are we just going to, are the SA going to be running amok forever? And Hitler manages to kind of dampen this down for the remainder of 1933. But then in 1934, beginning of 1934, it all kind of kicks off again. Because Ruhm, who is so restless and is always thinking that he's being sidelined and stuff, he writes a memo. I mean, it's hard to believe that he spends much time writing memos. But anyway, he writes a memo and he sends it to the army. And he says, OK, this is my plan. I think actually the SA should just be the army. Let's let stormtroopers could be the army. And the traditional army, they should just train our men. You know, we are the we should be the defense. Of. OK, and so what, what's Hitler's take on this? The army commanders go to Hitler and they say, oh, this is totally intolerable. Right, this 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 strutting bully cannot squeeze us out. Hitler agrees with them. He forces them to do a deal. And Rohm promises he'll behave himself. But then when Hitler goes out of the room, Rohm says to his men, he's overheard saying to his men, and I quote, what that ridiculous corporal declared doesn't apply to us. Hitler has no loyalty and we'll have to send him on leave. And if we can't do this with Hitler, we'll do it without him. So this is extraordinary. Hitler, who is the Fuhrer to most Nazis, who is the centre of the kind of Nazi cult, here is the guy who is commanding his paramilitary formation who's saying, actually, you know what? Hitler's turning out to be an obstacle to our revolution and maybe he'll have to go which is foolish isn't it because um i mean people who oppose hitler within the nazi party tend not to come off very well so there was a guy called gregor strasser wasn't there who'd been very much on the kind of socialist wing of the national socialists um and he had started opening negotiations with the the conservatives to make himself uh, vice chancellor and so hitler had elbowed him out and so presumably hitler is now thinking you know, this isn't just about the balance between the stormtroopers and the army. This is about my future. Now, here's the question, though. If he's going to take on the SA, what resources does he have? Because you've talked about the army, you've talked about the SA, but so far we haven't talked about the police. Yeah, so he's got the police 
Uh, the police have generally been t taken over, say, for example, in Prussia, by Nazi officials. Prussia is the biggest German state, and the guy who's initially taken over is Hermann Goering, who is... So he is in the cabinet as, as interior minister for yes, Prussia, yes. isn't he? So there's the police, there's, of course, the, the army, but there's also another power, um, sort of power center in the Nazi regime, an emerging um, power center, which is Hitler's bodyguard, and they are the SS. So they are... Schutzstaffel. So that's the protection squad, isn't it, in, in English? Yeah, much smaller than the, the stormtroopers, much smaller than the SA. They are more fanatical about Nazi ideology, less into the kind of street punch. I mean, they can be very violent, but they're less into the sort of the, the random street punch-ups. They're a crack squad of elite men, <laughs> as my brother, brother would was, say. Yeah. About 50,000 of them. Yeah, and they tend to be university educated. They spend a lot of time kind of talking about anti-Semitism. I mean, the classic sort of um, SS person is, I mean, obviously there's Heinrich Himmler, who had been a previously very sickly kind of idealistic person, fascinated by the occult and stuff. There's his deputy, Reinhard Heydrich. Heydrich is the son of, I think, an, an opera singer or something like that. Yeah. He's, a, he's a brilliant violinist. A fencer um, as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a brilliant fencer. A reservist in the, in the Navy. But a very has, sinister he has, man. He it's has a very, very high voice. He does indeed. He's a sort of. He's both sinister and sl I think slightly effeminate, isn't he, Heydrich, in his kind of very scary, sinister way. And Himmler. So he's head of the SS, which is yeah. kind of an elite paramilitary organization, and Hitler's Praetorian Guard, basically. I mean, you know, devoted to looking after Hitler mm -hmm. personally. But Himmler has also been engaging in a kind of power grab. So he's president of the Munich police, political police commander of Bavaria. Yeah. So there's this process by which intelligence and political sections in the police are being sidelined off and filled with Nazis. So Goering has been doing that in uh, Prussia. Mm -hmm. And Goering has set, he, you know, he, so he's, he's detached the intelligence political sections from the main body of the Prussian police. He's filled them with Nazis and he's merged them to form the secret state police, as he calls it, the Geheime Staatspolizei. So the Gestapo, as it's abbreviated to. So you're having that in uh, Prussia, but you're also having a similar process in Bavaria and then in the other German states. And Himmler is taking control of those, isn't he? So he's empire building, as Röhm is doing, as Göring is doing. Well, actually, Tom, what happens is that Göring hands control of the Gestapo of Prussia, doesn't in he? Prussia yeah. to Himmler because he basically... Also, the, these Nazis hate each other. They're all rivals at the court of Hitler. But all of Röhm's enemies basically decide it's in their interest to team up against him to make him the scapegoat and it's like bullies turning on each other and they decide one of them's going to be the scapegoat and that's the room and so Goering and Himmler and all these other people they basically decide to share out the power among themselves to, to, to sort everything out so that they can move against the room. But just to emphasize it's it's not just that they are teaming up as as political figures but as figures who have manpower yeah, as institutional them. figures because if hitler is going to take on the sa he obviously needs people who can you know wield the guns and the lorries and do the shooting and everything he does indeed are the army going to be complicit in this i mean will the army provide hitler help? is very anxious about the army because by the spring of 1934 the Hindenburg issue is more pressing than ever. It is very clear that there are a lot of people in the kind of national conservative elites who are close to the army who are extremely anxious that after more than a year, Hitler is getting more and more power and that he is not proving to be the kind of pliant tool that they hoped. So the classic example of this is this guy, Franz von Papen, who was chancellor a couple of chancellors ago. He's now Hitler's vice chancellor. You know, he's a man who basically wants to turn back the clock before the First World War and have a kind of arch-conservative kind of regime. And on the 17th of June, 1934, Papen gives a speech which is seen as a real threat to Hitler. It's actually an extraordinary moment in the history of the Third Reich. He, he says, under the German Revolution, under our revolution, selfishness, lack of character, insincerity, lack of chivalry and arrogance have all flourished. He says, we can't live in a constant state of revolution. We can't live with this constant state of unrest. And this is greatly cheered by the old order. And they say, thank God somebody has basically finally said it to Hitler. This jumped up little corporal from Austria who, you know, has got all these ghastly people running around on the streets. Hitler is furious about this. And he ends up having this summit meeting with Hindenburg and the head of the army. 
Werner von Blomberg, who is his defence minister. This is on the 21st of June. At Hindenburg's kind of castle, which is called Neudech in East Prussia. And the Hindenburg and the Blomberg, who's the head of the army, say to Hitler, listen, this has all gone too far now. You know, all this squabbling must absolutely end. You must bring your party and your movement to heal, to order. And that there's an implicit threat there, right? Which is that if Hitler doesn't act... The army will. Then the army will, exactly. Now, meanwhile, Tom, as you said, the Gestapo, the intelligence organisations, the police, which are under the control of Ernst Röhm's enemies, people like Himmler and Heydrich... And are now operating on a national level. Because there's, there'd been no national police force under the Weimar Republic, had there? So again, this concentration of police power and of SS power on a kind of federal level is giving Hitler the opportunity to strike, presumably. They go to Hitler and they say, we have evidence that the room, the SA, the stormtroopers, are planning a coup against you, that you are going to be kicked out. They maybe are in league with the French and, you know, the hour is dark. It could happen any moment now. You have to and move. Is this true? No. It's not true. <laughs> right. The SA so were another... never planning a coup. There was no deal with the French. The idea that, that, that Rouen was seriously going to launch a coup, he, he's actually not really organised enough to do it, and I don't think he has the will to do it, Tom. But on the 27th of June, the army chiefs, um, Werner von Blumberg and Walter von Reichenau, who's a very keen Nazi, they go to see Hitler and they say, look, you, you've got to move against him. You've got to do something about this. And Hitler says, fine, I've got an idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the stormtroopers leaders, the SA leaders. I'll meet with them at this spot. There's a lot of spa towns in this story, bizarrely, um, at a place called Bad Wiese, which is on Lake Tegensee, the Tegensee, which is southeast of Munich. And that's where Rome is hanging out at the moment. Rome's always going to spas with kind of blonde young men. Yeah, so it, it is sinister because the, these spa towns are kind of very dull, very bourgeois, aren't they? Faint hint of sulfur hanging in the air. And you can imagine um, room absolutely enormous. Sweating. Towel rats sweating, sweating like away. Yeah. Absolutely bright red. Um, and a very, very kind of creepy context for, for the drama that is to come. With a suspiciously young youth at his side, Tom, I think is the, uh, is the Ernst Röhm vibe. So Hitler says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically beard him in his, in his lair. <laughs> As this it were. This, yeah, <laughs> this spa town. Then the very next day, the 28th of June... Bizarrely, Hitler goes to a wedding in a place called Essen. Well known now, Tom, to fans of board games because they have a big, the world's biggest board game convention takes place in Essen, which is which is nice. Anyway, Hitler goes to this uh, wedding reception at Essen. Uh, a Gauleiter is getting married. And at the wedding reception, he is told Hindenburg and Parpen, your vice chancellor, the, the spokesman for the kind of national conservative old, old order, they're actually going to plotting to have a secret meeting but without you in a couple of days. And Hitler thinks, oh, my God, they're about to move against me. You know, the urgency is, is greater than ever before. I absolutely must take this opportunity to crush all my enemies in one go. So the room and the stormtroopers on one hand and the, uh, the representatives, the conservatives on the other. And he rushes off from the wedding reception. He'd be a rubbish person to have at a wedding reception anyway because, of course... Um, he doesn't. He doesn't drink and he doesn't smoke, and like and you, he Tom, likes he's to be a, the centre of attention. He's a vegetarian, um, so basically, if they're all eating sausages and beer and drinking beer and having a fine old time, he's a real misery to have at your he's wedding. Nibbling on some spinach, but presumably, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he he must ha he must hate weddings because he's he's not the focus. Yeah, of course, of course, he'd be the last person I'd invite to my wedding, Tom. I'll be on. I'll be frank. I mean, well, I had I'm you to my wedding. On the you came to my wedding, but I didn't have Hitler, and I wouldn't have had him. But to, but Dominic, yeah. to be fair, when you invited me, I didn't then go storming off and uh, order a blood bloodthirsty putsch. No, you so didn't. No, you didn't. There is I, that. I, I did feel. You... So I think the comparison can only be pushed so far. Okay. Is what I'm saying. I just want that on the record. <laughs> that well known. That comparison has dogged you. All your career. Anyway, so yes, Hitler races away from the wedding. He goes back to his hotel. He says, put the army on alert. We're going to move. He says to Goering, who's also at the wedding, presumably been stuffing himself with sausages. He says to Goering, go back to Berlin. Prepare to deal with the conservatives. I will handle the stormtroopers in Munich. You deal with the conservatives in Berlin. The night of the long knives, Tom, is about to get started. So uh, let's take a break there. And when we come back... Spa action. Hello, welcome back to The Rest is History. We are looking at the Night of the Long Knives. And Dominic, the Night of the Long Knives is approaching. 
But before it gets launched, we go to another spa, don't we? So we, we, promised, we promised listeners spas, and we are absolutely fulfilling that promise. An enormous amount of this podcast is Hitler just checking into and out of various hotels. So he's been to the wedding in Essen, and now he races to a town called Bad Gordersburg. So Bad in, is spa, right? In, in so. Westphalia. Because he's gone to look at some labour camps. He's gone to inspect some labour camps in Westphalia. And then he goes to this hotel, the Rhein Hotel in Bad Godesburg, where Goebbels comes to meet him. So Goebbels, who we haven't talked about, PhD in, what is it, sort of theatre, romantic theatre or something. The propaganda minister. Malignly genius at propaganda and exactly. all that kind of thing. Yeah. And because he writes a diary... We know loads about the Third Reich through Goebbels' diaries. So he's come to this hotel, and I imagine a hotel with white tablecloths. Absolutely. A little bit shabby yeah. and very elderly waiters. <laughs> I would almost certainly. And again, the faint smell of sulfur. So just that's the scene. And Goebbels pitches up, and Goebbels says, great, we're going to do this coup, this coup you know, within our own regime. And Hitler says, yes. Goebbels thinks it's going to be against the Conservatives. And Hitler says, it's not just against the Conservatives. It's also going to be against the Ruhm and the stormtroopers. Because I now have evidence that Ruhm is plotting with the French. And um, he says, you know, heads are going to roll. Blood will be shed. I remember when we were um, researching this, Tom, we were on a, a flight to Australia. And you said to me, you'd been reading all about it. And um, you'd come to the conclusion that Hitler was a very, Hitler was a, was a <laughs> terrible man. Hitler behaved yeah, very poorly. I really did. And I really did. And I mean, I, I mean, I, I had that vague impression. But when you get up close, he's a terrible man. Yes. <laughs> he you is. Wouldn't, I mean, if you're in a spa, you wouldn't want him turning up. That's what I'm saying. No. Because, I mean, he's, his violence against his enemies, horrendous, obviously. But sort of with Hitler's twisted worldview, explicable, I suppose. But his, he's now using that violence and that sort of sadistic ruthlessness against people who have been at his side for more than a decade. You know, partners in his movement. Well, because presumably he is Germany. He is the, you know, he's the embodiment of Germany. And so therefore, people who rub him up the wrong way are rubbing Germany up the wrong way. That would be his justification, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And I also think there's a histrionic side to Hitler. And when he is challenged, he can't take it. And because there's an enormous amount of him working himself up into a fury and kind of spitting and foaming at the mouth. Yeah. in this story isn't it so this is what he's doing in this hotel well i think that's what i conveyed in the opening passage absolutely oh, absolutely with the, the Clouseau kind of the... voice yeah it wasn't Clouseau; it was austrian oh, so austrian okay overnight 29th of june 30th of june hitler flies to munich and he right he, he takes a whole load of adjutants and bodyguards and he also takes goebbels with him and they land in munich rumors of this have obviously traveled around germany that something is coming some kind of confrontation between the stormtroopers and the rest of the party. And some of the stormtroopers have gone berserk already and have kind of been rampaging around the city, demonstrating. I mean, they've apparently been shouting in Munich, the Fuhrer is against us, the Reichswehr, the army, is against us. SA, come out on the streets, you know, show your defiance. Now, it's not so much a challenge to Hitler as an expression of their fear and frustration, I think. But Hitler interprets this as the beginning of the coup. And he says, right, we, we have to absolutely act immediately. So he goes to the Bavarian Ministry of the Interior, which is in Munich, and he summons the local leaders of the SA, who think of themselves, of course, as loyal to servants. Hitler. Yeah, they're Hitler's. They think of themselves as his keenest, most devoted servants. And I suppose These, in many cases they are, because they are. lots of them yeah. have, have been with Hitler since the very beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely they have. This is, this is Hitler's terribleness as a man, Tom. That they come in, you know, Mein Führer, you know, all this kind of meek and mild, and he grips the badges off their tunics and shouts at them, you're under arrest and you're going to be shot. Do you think there's spittle flying in their faces? There's all kinds of spittle, Tom. This is very a spittle and spa-rich story. They don't understand, they're terrified, and they're dragged off to prison. So then Hitler goes off. He's got another spa town to visit. Yeah, so now, yeah, of course he has. So now <laughs> he drives off to yet another spa town. This is Bad Wiese on the lake. Which is where, where uh, Rome has been staying. Where Rome has been sweating. With his towel and with his a, young, right, young exactly. lads. Hitler arrives at 6.30 in the morning with a load of SS bodyguards and police. So there's your, your sign, Tom, that you were talking about in the first half, the institutions that are backing Hitler the SS and the, and the police. And presumably, so Himmler is now, I mean, he is joined in a bond of blood with Hitler. 
Yes. Because he's providing Hitler with the means to uh, to to take the SA out. And haven't haven't hasn't the army given the SS the, the, the wherewithal, the weaponry yes, and the trucks exactly. and everything. The, the army know this is happening and they're happy with so it. So the army also, th- their fingers are going to be dabbled in the blood. It's a good point. That from this point onwards, it's not just that they have all, there's a kind of pact of blood against their internal enemies, the communists and the social democrats and so on, but against their own movement that will kind of bind them together. Anyway, Hitler arrives at this, the Hanselbauer Hotel, Yet another of these <laughs> yeah, kind faded of spa white hotels. tablecloths, ticking clock, elderly waiters. As you described in your reading, he bursts in. The first person he goes to is this is this like uh, SA group, senior group leader, Highness. Now Highness is a very predatory man, and he's dragged out of his room, and he's with this eighteen-year-old boy, a blonde-haired boy, and they're both locked up in a laundry room. So this is obviously very bad publicity for the stormtroopers. Then. Hitler goes in to see Rome. Rome is kind of, as you described, Rome is a bit bewildered by it, but he's kind of taken kind of out. Sleepy, yeah. He is, on? and he, he just sort of sits in the um, foyer of the hotel in the reception area smoking a cigar, like placidly unconcerned, so it appears, while all this bustle and people are being arrested all around him. Because I think Rome just thinks, well, this will probably, who knows what's going on, that this is going to sort itself out. Yeah. Meanwhile, Hitler is kind of rampaging around this spa hotel, bursting into people's bedrooms and shouting, arrested, arrested. Yeah, it's and the worst kind of spa break, isn't it? <laughs> people are being dragged out. They're all locked in like the laundry room, which is also the kind of the basement. They're being locked in the basement. Shambolically, loads more SA people are arriving because they think there's going to be a big meeting with Hitler. So as they're getting out of their cars, all the sort of smiles and handshakes, Hitler has them arrested. His men have to charter a coach, I think, from Bad Wiese. So it must be the only coach firm in Bad Wiese to take them all to Munich because they're so kind of ill-prepared. Eventually, Hitler goes back to Munich. He's, he's absolutely frothing at the mouth. People, people actually do describe spittle flying from his mouth as he, as he talks, Tom. He says, the room is guilty, he says, of the worst treachery in world history, which is a very it's a big claim. Uh, he says he's been given 12 million marks by the French and uh, he was going to hand Germany over to the French. We must kill all the him and his conspirators. And actually, all Hitler's cronies say, oh, I'd like to kill Rome, please. I mean, Rudolf Hess, who's like Hitler's poodle, begs him, virtually on bended knee, can I please have the privilege of shooting Rome? I mean, again, this paints the Nazis in a very bad light, Tom, because these are their own comrades. I mean, they're, all, they're their own partners in evil that they want to turn on. They go through lists and Hitler's kind of crossing them off. But actually, at first, he doesn't order that Rome be shot. He hesitates. Because presumably it's embarrassing. It's incredibly embarrassing. Because he's personally invited Rome back from Olivia. La yeah. Pad or whatever yeah. to, um, to run the SA. Exactly. So it reflects badly on his choice of, yeah. of I don't personnel. Think it's, Hitler is not a sentimental man. I don't think he's going to be sentimental about shooting Rome. But I think he knows it's, it's a big step. So this has been happening in Munich and most of the targets are the SA. But meanwhile, in Berlin, the man in charge there has been Goering. So Goebbels had, had run Goering that morning with a password, Tom. The password was Colibri, which is hummingbird. And, and when Goering heard that, he knew that it was time to move. Goering, also a, an absolutely <laughs> disgraceful man. He got dressed up specially in a white tunic, white boots. I mean, a white boots on a man, I think, is never a good look. And sort of blue trousers. So he cuts a very peacock-like figure and then he's striding up and down his office going through lists of people it's very kind of julius caesar tom well it's it's the prescriptions it's the tram for it he's saying they're going through lists and he's saying shoot him yeah shoot him and he's kind of bursting into loud laughter at the thought of all these shootings and all this kind of thing but all the people who end up being shot or not all the people but a lot of the people who end up being shot in berlin are the national conservatives kind of old order people right and the most significant is general schleicher who we mentioned the previous um, chancellor the previous chancellor and his wife yeah an ss squad arrive at their house open the door you general schleicher yes you are bang bang and his wife and they're both killed uh papen is not no shot, is he because that would be no. too embarrassing he's put under house arrest because he's, I mean, he's the vice chancellor it'd be incredibly embarrassing but his press chief and his speech writer so herbert von Boser and edgar jung who are the people who've been writing his speeches saying an end to the nazi revolution let's all calm down you know things have gone too far they are shot a load of other kind of old hitler rivals 
are killed in various ways. The Stra- Gregor Strasser. Yeah. The guy who was a kind of populist so he, this is, Nazi who had walked... Yes, the rival who'd stepped down. He'd gone off to become yeah. a chemist, and he gets killed. And a guy who had... Uh, for people who listened to the Rise of the Nazis, to the episode about the Beer Hall Putsch, there was a guy who was the big cheese in Munich in those days, who was a guy called Gustav Ritter von Kahr. He's actually hacked to death. He's cut into pieces um, by the SS, which is was very poor form, Tom. And there's, uh, you mentioned um, Roman history. Oh. After the murder of Julius Caesar, famously, a poet called Sinner, is killed in the mistaken belief that he is one of the conspirators. And a very similar thing happens with this, doesn't it? So a music critic. Yeah. Um, Schmidt. Who has the wrong name. Yes. Gets Because they think he's another Schmidt. And there's also a guy, I mean, a guy who'd actually helped him to produce, to edit Mein Kampf. A guy called um, Bernard Stempfler. He is killed as well by a complete accident. So in all, about 85 people are killed. There's a lot of score settling. Poetic justice, one might say. Poetic justice, very good. It's the settling of old scores. It's faction fighting, feuding. But it's also a message to two groups. One is the SA. You know, you'll get back in line, get back in your box. And the other is the Conservatives. And to the army. Yes. And presumably to the whole German people. Absolutely. So the room, just to tie up his fate, Hitler waits for an, um, another day but while he's deciding what to do with him there's some talk of a show trial but actually on the sunday the first of july at a garden party would you believe so, so it's the whole i mean it's the weird way in which there is this sense of faded gentility behind it you know who i'd like to see make a film about this uh, unexpected would be uh, wes anderson i, I knew you were gonna say wes anderson he loves a kind of faded spa town doesn't he yeah it, like the grand budapest hotel yeah something like that yeah well it's a sort of death of stalin you know, the, yes. the Armando Iannucci yes. film. There's that sort of... It's not a comedy, because obviously a lot of people die, but there is a kind of blackly comedy grotesque. side. Yes, it's side a grotesque. Yes. grotesque story, I guess. In a very grim way. Anyway, at the garden party, Hitler says, fine, room's got to go. So a load of blokes go to the prison in Munich, SS men, and they leave room with a pistol. They say he should take his own life, and they leave him with a newspaper where he can read about his own treachery, and hopefully this will encourage him to take his own life. After 10 minutes, there's been no, no shot. Yeah. So they come back in. Right, no good. As Ian Kershaw says in his book, uh, whether Room had used the 10 minutes to read the newspaper is not known. They take the pistol away, and then they come back in. Room, by this stage, rather bizarrely, has taken his top off and is standing there sort of topless, kind of in a sort of strutting pose. It's not clear whether this is a, a challenge or whether he wants to, he thinks it's better to greet his well, death. Well, it's a kind of bearing of the chest for a sword, I guess. I Maybe guess so, again, yeah. it's a kind of echo of a Roman. I don't know. Yes, although that, rather pathetically. Run me through, that kind of thing. Yeah, rather pathetically, rather like Indiana Jones shooting that bloke in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Y- yeah. They just shoot him, and then yeah. that's the end of him. He's dead. So the whole thing is done and dusted that so day. Could, Hitler's announcement on this is very... The former chief of staff, Rome, was given the opportunity to draw the consequences of his treacherous behaviour. He did not do so. And was thereupon shot. Yeah, very. that's all he says. Branding him with infamy. Yes. So he then goes to his cabinet on the 3rd of July and he says, yeah, I, I, I didn't have any recourse to legality. We've killed all these people. And the cabinet, they draft a law, law for the emergency defence of the state. And this law is obviously a total joke because the law says... Everything Hitler did in the last few days is there, yeah. is legal. That, that's literally the law. So it's a kind of retrospective... Yeah legal justification yes. for murder for mass murder hitler is clearly anxious about it because it takes him 10 days another 10 days before he goes to the reichstag to the parliament because presumably there are lots of people in the nazi party who've lost friends yeah of course and who are worried that hitler has gone mad and is turning on his own and so hitler must know this and must worry do i still have what it takes to command the mass of the party i guess Abs- i totally agree with you tom you know the the idea of camaraderie and brotherhood room by the way had incarnated that as part of that front generation the idea that we are a sort of brotherhood of steel formed in the furnace of the trenches but the irony of it is that these are people who um have absolutely propagated that idea of behaving with steel of mercilessly crushing enemies and also have fostered all kinds of grotesque and hideous conspiracy theories and they have now been monumentally hoist by their own petard They've been brutally yeah. crushed, and Hitler is kind of alleging all kinds of dark conspiracies against yes, them. Yes, absolutely. 
But he's still very, as you say, he's very anxious. So you said people lost friends. 13 members of the Reichstag have been killed in this purge. And there are people who were really close friends with some of the SA men who are in the Reichstag when Hitler gives the speech. And Hitler speaks for two hours. And he's completely unrepentant. And he says, sure, I broke the law. I took the law into my own hands. But he says, all I can say is, in this hour, I was responsible for the fate of the German nation, and I was the supreme judge of the German people. I gave the order to shoot those guilty of this treason, and I gave the order to burn down to the raw flesh the ulcers of our internal well poisoning and the poisoning from abroad. Can you have an, an ulcer of an internal well poisoning? I think you can if you're the Fuhrer. Yeah, I suppose you probably can. Because you can do what you like. And um, he, because also in that speech, he... he um, it is not my responsibility to ascertain whether, and if so, which of these conspirators, agitators, nihilists and well poisoners of German public opinion has been dealt too hard a lot. Rather, my duty is to make certain that Germany's lot is bearable. So basically, in other words, I can do what I like because I am Germany. Exactly. Exactly. L'état c'est moi. And you know what? The public like it. The German people, by and large, I think it's fair to say, are pretty happy because a lot of people are deeply resented the SA, the bullying, the street violence. They thought they were thugs, football, like jumped up football hooligans. And finally, the Fuhrer has cracked down on them. Good for him. Maybe Rome was plotting with the French. You know, great that he got no one liked him. Get rid of him. I mean, the thing about the SA is that um, violence is seen as as legitimate. And so if you are, I don't know, an average citizen going out for your Saturday shopping or whatever, and you have gangs of pot-bellied guys in brown shirts waving flags and shouting slogans. It's menacing and intimidating. And you yeah, want to see it come exactly. to an end. It's perfectly judged, actually, to appeal to those middle-class people who basically want a quiet life. They want order. They want Germany to be great again. They want an end to unemployment and inflation and all the things that they associate with the Weimar Republic. And, you know, the fewer strutting bully boys in their little town, as far as they're concerned, the better. So they're delighted. And what about the army? The army are absolutely... I mean, there are lots of winners. So the SS are big winners, of course. Himmler will now accumulate more and more power. His what had begun as a bodyguard now becomes the kind of, as you said, the Praetorian Guard, unchallenged Praetorian Guard um, of the Nazi regime. But the army in particular. Werner von Blumberg, the defence minister, the guy who's supposedly speaking up for the Reichswehr for the army, he had led the vote of thanks to Hitler in the cabinet meeting so with all this settled a month later the big development hindenburg is on his deathbed the president hitler flew to see him on the 1st of august that is castle in east prussia hindenburg was so far gone that he mistook hitler for the kaiser and addressed him as kaiser i mean what a symbolic moment tom hitler goes back to berlin knowing that hindenburg only has hours left and he has all his ministers put their names to a law that says when Hindenburg is dead, in, in to honour him, it's like retiring the shirt of a footballer. The office of Reich president will be retired. But Dominic, am I right in thinking that the idea for that actually comes from the army, not from Hitler? Well, the idea for the oath comes from the army. So the office is retired, Reich president. There will now just be a Führer, a leader and Reich chancellor. We always say Führer, but actually Richard Evans in his books on the Third Reich calls him the leader because, you know, let's sort of demystify the word and think of it as Germans would have thought of it there is just going to be one leader and Blomberg and Reich now the army chiefs exactly as you just said they think let's bind Hitler to us and the way we'll do that is we make everybody in the army swear an oath of unconditional loyalty to the leader as supreme commander and of course what they don't realise is instead of binding Hitler to the army they are binding the army to Hitler because everything that follows, all the crimes in the Second World War come from this. So it, it's exactly repeating the mistake that the conservatives have made in thinking that they could use Hitler, they could ride this particular tiger. Later in this series, we will explore a bit more why the army thought that because it's at, so much of it is about Hitler's foreign policy ambitions and how much at first it appears that they dovetail with the army commander's ambitions to have a strong army to make Germany great again, all this kind of stuff. But just for the time being, there's a plebiscite, a referendum, to approve this change. Uh, that happens in the middle of August. 90% of um, the public approve that Hitler 
is head of state, head of government, leader of the Nazi party. But it's still not quite kind of North Korean not levels. Not quite. I There's believe. an awful lot of intimidation and, and whatnot surrounding these, these. I mean, Hitler loves a referendum. This is a great series for Spartans and referendums. <laughs> this is what it's all about. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's already a cult of Hitler. In their brilliant books on uh, the Third Reich, both Serene Kershaw and Sir Richard Evans talk a lot about this, about the poems, about the Hitler trees, about the Hitler squares and streets. That had started in 1933, but in 1934, it really becomes embedded and gathers momentum, and it becomes what people call a kind of Führer state. Everything is about the leader. The, the Führer is Absolutely. the Absolutely. He is right. Germany. I mean, it's not, it's not that he's representing Germany. He is, he is Germany. Germany. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, the Führer Prinzip, the idea of working towards the Führer, all of these ideas. And all of this reaches its kind of symbolic apotheosis. Just a few weeks later, there is a, an assembly, Tom, of the Nazi party in a great city in southern Germany. And many of our listeners would have seen the extraordinary cinematic images of Hitler uh, walking through the parade grounds, Star Wars, past the serried ranks of stormtroopers and Nazi party members and soldiers. Now, what that moment is, we will discuss next time because I know you're very excited because you're going to be taking us through this story of what happens at Nuremberg in 1934 and the window that that offers us into the the world of Nazism, Nazi ideology, Nazi, Nazi, Nazi propaganda. propaganda, all of that stuff. Now, the way, Dominic, that the Nazis set about brainwashing Brilliant. the nation. So that's all very exciting. Now, the great news, we love to brainwash a nation ourselves. In fact, brainwash the world, Tom. Well, we love to brainwash a podcast do. audience, don't we? So if you're in the mood for a little bit more brainwashing, you can hear the rest of this series right now by signing up at The Rest Is History. Dot com. Now, just to give you a sense of what the series is going to be, there will be episodes on Nazi propaganda and Nazi ideology. There will be uh, two episodes on Hitler's road to war, his plans for war, and also on the Anschluss with Austria, with uh, Hitler's native land. And there will also be an episode about the Nazis and the Jews, and in particular, Kristallnacht. And Tom, on that bombshell, we will see you all at Nuremberg. Goodbye.